This video is made possible by 28 Mobile. Hey guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg with the Galaxy S5 Prime, or more accurately, the Galaxy S5 LTE A. This is the long rumored top shelf version of the Galaxy S5 with a Snapdragon 805 CPU clocked at 2.5 GHz, an Adreno 440 GPU, 3 gigs of RAM, and a WQHD display, sometimes referred to as Quad HD or 2K. This display has a resolution of 1400 by 2560 with a staggering pixel density of 576 ppi. That's the highest of any mobile display currently. This is a Korean exclusive phone with no plans to expand internationally at this time. So if you want one in your neck of the woods, check out 28 Mobile. A link will be in the description below. Now inside the box, we'll find the phone on top wrapped in plastic on the back and front. And as is often forgotten, a piece of plastic around the camera lens, which we also had to peel off. Inside the box, we'll find our paperwork in Korean, a micro USB 2.0 charging cable instead of a 3.0 cable, which the GS5 actually supports. We also get our charger, which has a fixed USB cable, once again, USB 2.0 instead of 3.0. We also get a set of Samsung in-ear headphones with a remote control and microphone and replacement ear tips. As is common with Korean phones, we also get two sets of 2800 milliamp hour batteries with NFC built in. We also get an external battery charger, which I find very useful. So instead of leaving my phone connected to the charger, with this I can simply recharge the batteries and swap them out as I need to. I really like this feature. For the most part, this still looks and feels exactly like a standard GS5 we're all familiar with. We have a removable back panel with a watertight gasket to retain the IP67 certification we're all familiar with. At the bottom, we have the micro USB 3.0 port behind a water sealed flap. You also have to supply your own USB 3.0 cable to take advantage of the transfer speeds of this port however. On the back we have a waterproof speaker with a little bump out that prevents the speaker from being muffled. We also have our 16 megapixel camera with 4K video recording along with an LED camera flash and the heart rate monitor. On the left we'll find the volume rocker and on the right we'll find the sleep wake button. On the top we have the waterproof headphone jack, microphone, and an IR LED blaster for controlling your AV equipment. On the front, we have the home button with the integrated fingerprint scanner and backlit Android controls. On the top, we'll find a waterproof earpiece, sensors, front-facing camera, and the LED notification light. Now, the design of the GS5 and GS5 LTEA differ only slightly. The biggest difference is the color of the chrome trim, which is kind of a coppery gold color on every version of the GS5 Prime. The color is actually very subtle and difficult to notice unless you're comparing them side by side. You can see, however, that the back panel still retains the same modern glam effect of the standard GS5 with that pearlescent color in the case of the white models I have here. The other difference is a darker dot pattern around the bezel, which is especially notable on the white model. Now, in my case, I was able to get the GS5 Prime to work on AT&T's LTE network thanks to a few tips from tech YouTubers OT4Tech and Danny Winget. The first thing you'll need to do is to set up a custom APN for AT&T's LTE network. Now, if you want to grab these settings, I'll just scroll through here on the screen and you can pause and pick them up as you want, but I'll also post them in the description below. I also found that you'll need to delete all other APNs in order for this to work. Next, you'll need to activate the network by going to the dialer and punching in star pound 0011 pound. That'll take you to a network settings configurator. Just hit that button at the bottom and select the automatic mode. Now, once you reboot, you should be all set to go. Now in terms of software, the GS5 is running Android 4.4.2 with TouchWish, which has been modified slightly in a few places on the GS5 Prime. Now the GS5 Prime does include Download Booster, which is a feature I haven't been able to use on other variants of the GS5. Essentially, this feature combines LTE and Wi-Fi to increase download speeds of files over 30 megs. Now when activated, you will see a progress indicator which breaks down the network speeds on both services. This works when downloading movies, apps, and that sort of thing. You also see a progress indicator in the notification shade when you swipe down. The GS5 Prime also adds festival effect to the settings panel, which when activated displays holiday themed animations and wallpaper for your birthday or specific holidays commonly celebrated in Korea. So for example, the 4th of July wasn't observed on the GS5 Prime this past weekend. Now the NFC settings on the Prime has also been enhanced for the Korean market where NFC is commonly used in lieu of credit cards or transportation cards. Although there are many other small changes, the only one worth noting here is the transition effect when resizing windows in multi-window mode. The GS5 Prime adds a fade-in transition when resizing the window, while the GS5 has no transition at all. Although not tremendously noticeable, performance on the GS5 Prime seems to have improved, particularly with the presence of 3 gigs of RAM. The overall system performance is more stable under load, but otherwise these devices act 
pretty much the same. Now in terms of synthetic benchmarking, I will compare the Prime to my Exynos OctaCore S5 instead of the Snapdragon one that's more popular. With the 3 d Mark Ice Storm Unlimited test, the GS5 Prime scores around 19,391 versus 12,687 on the Exynos GS5, which is a significant improvement. With the Antutu benchmarks, both phones performed nearly identically, scoring above 36,000, although the Exynos beat it by a few hundred points. Now with Geekbench 3, both phones scored nearly identically with an edge given to the Prime thanks to a higher single core score. Now really the big feature here is the WQHD display with a pixel density of 576 which dwarfs the 432 on the standard GS5 or the 326 on the Retina display of the iPhone. Generally speaking, it's nearly impossible to tell the difference with the naked eye. The GS5 Prime's color temperature is slightly warmer than the standard GS5 which is mostly noticeable when looking at the white space or off axis. The pixel density increase is almost imperceptible. The GS5 already has one of the best displays on the market and the GS5 Prime doesn't really do much to improve that. The increased sharpness is probably most noticeable when looking at small text since it's actually rendered to the resolution of the display. Otherwise, most items can't take advantage of that resolution. And even graphical elements that do take advantage of the resolution don't look noticeably sharper. I think in this case, WQHD is largely wasted on displays this size where the pixel density is already beyond the reach of the human eye. Larger displays like the 5.5 inch LG G3 do a better job showing off the benefits of QHD. G3 has a pixel density of 534 and is using an LCD IPS display instead of the Super AMOLED display of the Samsung. Now compared to GS5's display, the G3 is certainly much larger, but it's also much less saturated with, with notably duller colors with washed out blacks, especially off axis. Whites appear much more pink on the G3 and are not as bright as you typically see on LCD displays. While the whites on the GS5 are a little cooler, but about as bright as the G3. Generally speaking, the GS5 display looks better in comparison, but the G3 display size does a better job taking advantage of the QHD resolution. So in conclusion, the GS5 Prime is without a doubt the best spec phone you can buy right now, but much of that doesn't really change the user experience in any meaningful way. The display doesn't look any sharper and performance hasn't really changed notably. I think the spec that makes the biggest impact here is three gigs of RAM, which TouchWish can definitely use to improve performance. But overall, this phone is really meant to be sold on its specs rather than the end user experience. So that's gonna do for me in this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next video.